malaria is a, a tricky situation, and you know that behind malaria is a vector called a mosquito. Uh, therefore, if you are able to play around with mosquito, the malaria is done. But uh, you will come to realize that the situation is not as simple as that. And uh, behind malaria, there are victims. The majority are children below five years, pregnant women, and uh, the newborns. Well, we have been, uh, the, National uh, malaria, the National Malaria Control Program has been able to come up with strategies to combat malaria. It's a cocktail, again, of many strategies, among which it involves, uh, I would start with the uh, vector control, because that is the main uh, concern, and then uh, other uh, strategies have been also brought on board to try to see how this condition can be combated, but nevertheless, there still have been uh, no major success towards eliminating the disease. Just to say a little bit on the challenges to end malaria, a number of challenges, as you can see, my road there is overloaded by a number of passengers there. It ranges from the health systems, the poverty at an individual and national level, the level of education, and many, many other factors. But so to say, I have tried to summarize the most common ones which are found in the literature, among which is inadequate diagnostic equipment in some of the health facilities, inadequate trained personnel who can be able to check properly through the microscope and tell you whether there's malaria or not. There is, again, irrational use of antimalarial drugs. As you know, malaria comes in a form of fever, so if you are not careful, you will end up to treating each fever as a malaria. And this has been an issue which has uh, uh, created a lot of drug pressure, which ended up to creating drug resistance. One of the challenges also, again, is the poor quality of malaria drugs, which end up to giving low levels of the drugs in, in the blood. As the result, the parasite doesn't die. And uh, sorry to forget that. The parasite that causes malaria is Plasmodium phasmatum. And there are numbers of types of malaria. Here we are talking of malignant malaria, which is caused by Plasmodium phasmatum. Another challenge is, especially when we are talking of drugs that are given through many doses, it appeared like one once starts feeling okay, it or she doesn't finish the dose. So if you know there's no adherence to the treatment and therefore leading to uh, antimalarial uh, drug resistance. And uh, to be able to combat it, the uh, vector, we, the uh, insecticide were used, but uh, you, uh, the, the, these insecticides are not uh, used only for, for uh, uh, mosquito, but also they are used in agriculture and therefore this overuse of the insecticides have led to the development of resistance to, to these uh, uh, agents. Now, because of this, uh, we found ourselves moving from chloroquine when I was young. Uh, chloroquine was the drug of choice. And then we changed to SP, and now we are talking of artemisinin in combination therapy. And there's one candidate of ours who's doing a research to try to see if you combine maybe a, a, a artemisinin in combination therapy plus primaquine perhaps it may lead to improved quality of malaria treatment. And we are thinking that if some of the trust strategies fail, perhaps a kind of triple therapy is being, is being practiced in HIV may be tested. Uh, in addition to those challenges which I have mentioned, uh, uh, as you know, uh, previously we were using SP, cyphodoxine, pyrimethamine, drug combination as a prophylactic drug uh, for pregnant women, but now this drug has developed resistance. So currently we don't have an effective drug for prophylaxis of malaria. This is again a challenge in this group. And again, some of the, the, the studies which were done by some of our people in our group found out that treating comorbidities uh, malaria in comorbidities like someone with HIV 
could also pose a challenge. And they also, we also came to realize that there could be also a challenge in treating married and pregnant women, and they'll come back to that. So what is the contribution of Muhaisi researchers in collaboration with Swedish uh, scientists whom I mentioned uh, on the first page? Uh, we have been conducting our studies in the rural areas uh, where the disease is harbored. And uh, we have one of the contribution of this group is to in the in the preparation of new treatment guidelines. When SP developed, when chloroquine developed resistance, studies from our groups generated data that showed that indeed chloroquine was no longer effective. And similarly, when we moved from SP to, SP to AST, there were a number of publications that evidenced that indeed the drug was not effective. So we have been playing a role in the treatment guideline formulations. And we work together in collaboration with the National Malaria Control Program. Uh, in addition to that, as I mentioned before, the, 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 the personnel problem in which the uh, kind of coming up with the really diagnosis was an issue. Therefore, we have tried to investigate whether if uh, training into the diagnostic algorithm in combination with the microscope could improve malaria diagnosis. And indeed, we came to realize that in the group which was trained for both microscope and the algorithm, there was a reduction of antimalarial drug. And the concern here is want to make sure that not each malaria, each fever is treated as a, a, a malaria. And therefore, through this training, we were able to save some drugs, which is very good for the country because that money could go to my village and perhaps help to install some electricity there. We also uh, have uh, tried through our PhD research students to convince the National Malaria Control Program to institute malaria rapid diagnostic test. And as you know, there are many uh, types, but uh, uh, Gasala and uh, his colleagues was able to select the most sensitive and the selective rapid diagnostic test of this type. And finally, we tried to assess the use of MRDT vis-a-vis and we were able to also confirm that indeed you can reduce the number of antimalarial prescriptions and improve malaria treatment by using MRDT. And MRDT is very simple. You just prick, get small blood, and then you dip a, a, a strip there. If it changes the color, you are able to confirm whether the, the individual has got malaria or not. Through various studies, again, we are able to convince the nation that there have been infiltration of substandard antimalarial drugs. And uh, through this, uh, we have been able to convince uh, TFDA to kind of now institute a policy of changing each of, of, of I mean, of of, of checking the quality of each antimalarial drug. Some, oh, some, some few challenges, as I mentioned, the, we noted through our PhD candidate who was trying to study the influence of antimalarial, um, anti-HIV drugs uh, on the treatment outcomes in case one is co-infected. We came to realize that those who were treated, those who had malaria, and they were receiving a nevirapine, a favilence based therapy as, composed, as compared to those, to those who were just receiving antimalarial without an, ant antitro an antitroviral drug, had kind of similar treatment. I mean, this is plasma concentration against time. I'm trying to use a simple language so that we can all understand each other, so that it's not everyone is in the system. So you see that 
nevirapine did not influence the level of antimalarial drug compared to those who are receiving an antimalarial alone, but if you come to this effavilence, you see, effavilence is dramatically bringing down the plasma concentration of an antimalarial drug. And you know, when there is low plasma concentration of a drug, perhaps there will be no treatment outcomes, as it is illustrated in this figure, that to be able to experience therapy, the drug must swim within this region. If it is below, as we observed in a favilence arm, there will be no treatment, but if it, again it is too high, you experience uh, toxicity. One of our PhD students also has been studying the complications and difficulties in treating uh, malaria in pregnant women. As a standard, the plasma concentration of the drug should be 280 nanogram per mil in a normal population, you and me. But surprisingly, in pregnant women, they require higher plasma concentration. Now, the challenge is now that, yes, they require higher plasma concentration, but the doses which is given is the same. So how are you going to get this higher plasma concentration? So the, the outcome of which is that the majority of pregnant women may experience uh, treatment uh, uh, failure. So in summary, the group has been able to contribute to the national treatment policy. It was engaged in the formulation of the treatment guidelines from chloroquine to sulfadoxine, pyrimethamine, to a uh, combination therapy. And now we are thinking maybe if, if this fails, what next? We have a student out there who was at the post, our posters there, he's working on what next if His Excellency ACT fails. So we are still engaged. We have also contributed to compulsory testing of malaria before malaria prescription. Uh, we also contributed to adoption of rapid diagnostic test as an adjunct to uh, uh, microscopy. So we have been able to reduce the consumption of antimalarial drugs and we have improved the malaria, uh, malaria diagnosis and the TFDA through our data have been able to be convinced to take the, pap, uh, the, 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 the testing of the code of drug as one of the policy. So to summarize through the CEDA support and through our researches and the researches of different stakeholders, Malaria has been able to be brought down if you compare the prevalence uh, of the mortality and the morbidity from the year 2004 to 2006. You see the malaria trend is going down. And uh, if you look now, the prevalence is, 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 is around, uh, it had gone down, <laughs> interesting. It had indeed gone down. It's, if you go back here, you see that it's, it's almost going to, to down to be eliminated. But something happened in between here, and we are seeing the figure which is coming to 14 now. Uh, 18, 90.8, and now the my prevalence is 14. Well, that means that more energy needs to be done by group. So a summary of what is going on now with the, our students who have uh, now added on another uh, uh, PhD uh, cohort, and uh, we have four PhD students. One of them will be studying the effective uh, drug which can be of use in the prophylaxis uh, of malaria in pregnant women. He's in second year. There's another guy who is trying to study the efficacy of price quantity in combination with the one antimalarial drug and trying to manage the schizostomiasis mansonai, which is a challenge uh, to uh, our people, especially those who are living near lake zones. Uh, one of our students is trying to see what will happen after ACT alone has failed. And finally, we have another student who is now trying to come out from a synthesized compound, but to kind of engaging 
natural products as an alternative to testing an insecticide that can be used as a vector control of a, a almost mosquito. So to say, let me thank Sida for supporting my training. And now today I stand before you as a professor and many, many professors here in this room because of, of Sida's support. We also thank our Swedish collaborators who were able to bring our capacity to be able to run a highly powered studies which could generate data that are important in shaping the policy of the country. But also we thank the leadership of MUHAS because they could say, no, 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 you are not going to Sweden, you have to teach. They gave us permission and the Tanzanian government, of course, for facilitating the atmosphere. But uh, of almost, most, most important is God, because without God, we couldn't, we couldn't be. <sighs> Thank you very much. <laughs>